Welcome to the Alapa Podcast, the home for cultural chit chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk. Hello, this is the BBC, no ad, the <laughs> latest installment of, you know, the Elaborate Podcast. Joining me in studio is Mary. How's it going? We're not recording this again. This is straight through. Very well, thank you. Um, so, yeah, um, Ennio Morricone, you told me the news today. The great composer uh, of many a Western, um, of The Mission, um, Gabriel Zobo, of course, from that movie as well. So, uh, you always hear about celebrities passing away and it's always sad on a human level but when you actually you know many of them I wasn't particularly a fan of so I didn't feel the loss as such of of that person in terms of their music or or their creative output but as I said you know obviously on a human level you 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 acknowledge the sadness of of somebody passing away but uh, I I think it's the first time in a long time a well-known figure has died that I am a big fan of um, and I grew up listening to his music. So um, it is a tremendous loss in terms of music and, and culture. And I know you were a big fan as well of, of his stuff, no? Yes, I find it really sad too, to be honest. I don't know, of course, you know, whenever someone dies, it's always sad. But um, I think I was just thinking about that this morning that you know, something like a musician, a composer, or somebody like a writer. You can like it, and you can like similar things, but it's never going to be exactly that person's voice. Um, So it's just really sad, because you sort of think, well, there's never going to be another, you know, Cinema Paradiso theme tune, or or the mission, there might be all the similar ones that you like, but it cannot be that output of that person anymore, so that feels quite sad to me. Um, Yeah, and he definitely seems like a guy, you know, because Quentin Tarantino had him for his movie Django Unchained, and, um, you know, Maracone said he would never work with him again, you know, (laughs) Um, but he's worked with so many people. He's worked with Robert De Niro, he's worked with Clint Eastwood, obviously, and uh, just someone having this longevity um, and this kind of variation in his in his work, um, he truly was a genius. Um, now, obviously, today um, you you know back in the nineties, I've, I've always loved music soundtracks. So you've had uh, James Newton, Howard Shore, Hans Zimmer, of course, you know, and these are the the guys you go to now, you know, um, for for music uh, for a movie. Um, but sometimes, you know, how like Hans Zimmer, um, apparently for the latest project he's working on, it's completely different from anything he's worked on before. So I think, yeah, he's going to show us as his career develops what he has in his bag of tricks. But uh, for the other um, composers, and they're fantastic, um, they don't have the range that Ennio Morricone had. And just, I mean, I remember a few years ago, there was a Kevin Spacey movie uh, called Baby Driver, where the driving scenes were matched exactly to the music. Well, at least they said it was. I, I couldn't tell. But it's a good movie. Um, but, like, if you want to, like, I mean, that was, like, this new innovative thing. But uh, for this, the Spaghetti Westerns, for the, the, Man with no Name, the Man With No Name trilogy, music played such an integral part um, in the story not just with the action to drive up the the, 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 the action and the entertainments and the, the adrenaline of, of the movie, um, either in the middle of the movie for a scene or for the, the denouement of that movie as well. But it was also used to, to, to bring out the emotional register even of these movies, you know, because there's a scene in The Good and Bad, The Ugly, where um, they are um, forced to play while they're... I think it's... If I remember correctly... This, the context of the scene is I think it's during the Civil War and uh, the captured soldiers are forced to 
play music while their compatriots or their soldiers on the same side are being tortured as well and it's 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 done with such um grace and it really tells and advances the story but even more sophisticated than that like at the end of that movie the way the music builds up the tension and works and i know it sounds so pretentious but like the interplay with the camera as it moves from the different characters like it's so perfectly in sync and even in either the second or first movie it's lee van cleef is there as well and there's like a locket I think it's called um, like Clara's theme. I, I could be wrong about the name because I'm not very good with names. But again, just the the beat of the action uh, is completely at the mercy of the music. The music is driving everything, um, and it switches from like just high tension of a shootout to kind of the emotional meaning of, of who this woman is and why one of the cowboys is holding her her locket. You know, so um, it just even back then, spaghetti westerns were seen as something that was just maybe throw throw away kind of like most of them were b movies or whatever but he was an artist who um was using his craft to elevate it into something um far more interesting you know obviously you have the director and and clint eastwood as well but uh he was definitely a major part of that story you know so i mean i I just admire him greatly for that and then of course as we know he's gone on to do other things as well I, I can say more but uh, I know you mentioned the mission to me as well um, so why is the mission um, one of the, the, the standouts for you in your memory of Ennio Morricone well I think of course it's one of the most famous ones but I just think it's uh, so emotional I mean I think the the main thing about thing about him which of course you could say of any good composer but it's like bringing out the emotions um but it's just like uh, the definition of the emotion so for me that's something that it does amazingly because i think in general very good tunes um obviously make you emotional but sometimes just generically emotional and i think he's very good at portraying a very specific uh you know uh, a trait so for example in Cinema Paradiso, like this nostalgia. I mean, it's almost like when you listen to it, it's, you, even if you didn't know what the film is about, you know that that's what the song is portraying. And then with the mission, is that feeling of like complete peace, um, which is very much linked to, well, this kind of like religious dimension, of course, that uh, is part of the movie. Um, I was lucky enough last year to to be in the well the national um, I don't know, great concert hall or whatever um, and um, yeah with my dad was like uh, singing there and they had a big orchestra and it was a film night and they they did the song with the choir and everything. And it was just breathtaking. I mean, I was listening to it this morning, and you know, it just it was really hard not to not to get very emotional because um, yeah, it's very it just wraps you, and and um, I think that was conveyed by a lot of people this morning. Like I went to listen to several songs. Um, it's not. Um, it's quite, I mean, I listen to it regularly, so it's not as if it was, like, very hard to find. Um, but this song in particular from from the mission, um, there were a lot of comments below, and many of them on YouTube, many of them were, well, some of them were from today, sort of, like, you know, um, expressing their condolences, but many of them were, like, from all the confinement months from different countries. And it really struck me because... Some people were saying, you know, I'm a COVID nurse or um, or I'm a driver and this really brings me peace at the end of the day and and I use it to, like, calm down. And all the people were, of course, saying that for them it had um, a religious dimension. This song in particular, not obviously because of the the uh, association with uh, uh, religion, but but just in general, that is sort of like elevated them. And some of them were comparing it to Beethoven or Verdi of like this era. And 
yeah, I mean, what what more can you <laughs> can you ask for that um, that people say that they they get very emotional and you know um, people in like very stressful situations or people that have had uh, relatives passing away they just like found some solace in this music so I find that um, you know it's like it's it's the the, the very role of, of music to to achieve that. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting because uh, he did once upon a time, once upon a time in the West, and then the kind of movie Once Upon a Time, um, the one that's with Robert De Niro set in America, and the Deborah theme from that movie. Um, some woman put on YouTube that her her, her husband passed away listening to it. Um, you know, so but you know, it just shows like that all these different songs and different movies um, have given people a lot of, um, I guess, uh, warmth or or some kind of positive feeling. Uh, but also, um, you know, we should say as well like that. Yeah, the, once upon a time in America is the name of the movie. Um, that he actually completed the the scoring before any scenes were shot, and they they played the music on set while they filmed the scenes as well. So that's how influential the music was. Um, that it, like it was on set to kind of give the characters the maybe the emotional cues, or they could kind of pace it around that as well as we kind of previously mentioned. So um, yeah, you gave a really great explanation of what it meant for you. Um, he meant a lot for me as well, and I'm sure well, I know for a lot of people around the world as well. Uh, Eddie Maraconi was, um, uh, I guess, a comfort and uh, an example of a great musician as well. So. On that note, we'll just take a, a musical break here and we'll come back with part two. Welcome to part two of the podcast, and now we're going to continue with uh, themes of culture. We're going to talk about a book uh, by John Pilger, uh, written a few years ago, um, so this is not a promo, um, about, uh, it's, a, it's a curation, a selection of articles from uh, journalists who have been involved in investigative journalism, as like a pay-in to, to brave men and women who've gone to dangerous places telling stories um, that people are trying to stop being told. And then uh, another writer, um, yeah, his name is Fernando Pessoa, a Portuguese writer, and a bit of a strange guy, a bit of a strange book, and we're going to talk about that book uh, also, uh, called The Book of Disquiet. So I'm going to give a bit of a background to it, and then we'll bring Mary into it, because she's a translation guru do I, I i will say at this point that i i translated a book last summer that is on pre-sale in america right now and if i know anything about robbie williams he wanted to make it big in america and now i'm following in his footsteps but yeah as i said it's another podcast so um i went to the museum of casa lopa de vega which i would not recommend by the way but i did go to uh, a bookshop uh, that's nearby in, in the Barrio de las Letras. So it's the kind of, um, you know, you have the Calle um, Loba de Vega, you have Calle Cervantes. Um, so it's a lot of streets named after famous Spanish writers. So, of course, there's a bookshop there. Um, and there weren't many titles in English. And now I do read in Spanish as well. But uh, I was looking for one in English because it's the summer. And um, there weren't many there. There's one with Brooke Shields who wanted to go on the Camino and, and she was talking about going to the toilet in the bush and some guy asking for her autograph. And I was like, I don't have all that money in the world, so I'm not going to buy it. Could be an interesting story, but in, not many options in English either. Um, so I picked this book for some reason. Nice cover, beautiful design. Um, and I just opened it, which I think was the second part of the book, which will be relevant in a moment as well. And I just thought it was so raw and real and, again, pretentious. I know that it, I'm describing this in a way that seems very cheesy, but um, it just it just he was talking about um, just his life in a, in a way that was very engaging. 
Um, and I just thought it was like this is a diary of a real man. Like in a way, Joseph Roth uh, walked around Berlin in the twenties and thirties. Um, and then it's not his diary, but it is. You know, and here is the enigma of Fernando Pessoa. Uh, so the idea is. Uh, he's a guy who um, wrote prodigiously, but he wrote with different pseudonyms. And these characters he created all through his life, and he wrote everything as well. He wrote uh, academic journals, articles, books, um, poetry. Though he wasn't a very successful poet, uh, it has to be said. Um, and sometimes he wrote these through the eyes of these characters and these characters could have opinions or ideas that were opposite to what he believed but then not really either so there's all this kind of contradiction going through it as well um and so this book it turns out to me uh, after reading the introduction very interesting introduction about how uh, part one uh, is based on this guy who's just alone um and part two is about this clerk who writes in his spare time. And, and the author, Fernando Pessoa, was a clerk um, as well. Um, and so that's kind of based on his real life, even though it's not him in the book. Um, and then the like you, you read the book and the first chapter is like the writer, Fernando, uh, and he meets this character and he, and he describes him and, and how lonely he is. And, and this character gives him a manuscript. And then the rest of the book is his manuscript. And it's this very... Um, abstract and kind of surreal and not surreal but it's very kind of abstract um, emotive um, and just about how everything is kind of terrible but um, and then you know then the second part of the book is kind of written in a more direct style and it's, it's more uh, approachable or it's more uh, understandable um, and that was the part that I actually happened to open in the bookshop so um, that's probably the best part of the book. Um, so yeah, and then this book um, itself, I mean, this was like a lifetime project. He never wanted to finish it. He said finishing it would be would be cowardice. Um, and it was found after he died. And I think it was, I think he died, you know, in the first half of the 20th century. And, this, and the book was only published for the first time in the 80s. So... The fact that, and they, like, I mean, different translations and different books have different versions of it because it's all scraps of paper. And uh, in this edition, they've put it in chronological order. And they've built it up from these scraps of paper. Um, and I think it was an interesting story in itself. And apparently, it's based on his kind of life as well, in terms of like how he first moved, to, his father died, his mother remarried, he went to South Africa, then came back to Portugal. And Portugal for him was the best place on earth and he just wrote about it constantly. Now they mention in the book that in other versions of or other editions the translators have put things together thematically but they make the choice of not doing that because they think that's a violent interruption in something that and that's something that shouldn't happen. Now where I want to bring you in as well is in terms of the translation because especially in the first part there's so many abstract things um, and the the translators is basically saying, like, I don't know sometimes what he's trying to say, but I, I'm following the clues that he leaves us. And even if it's not accurate, um, that's okay too because um, it's it's like a way of um, like capturing what he was talking about anyway. So he's like cap talk, It's a feeling he's trying to capture. And if you capture a feeling, that's part of the book as well. So, kind of that fits into the book as well. Like, so so much duality. He is this person. He isn't. And maybe it's the correct translation, and maybe it isn't. But it doesn't matter. Um, is what they're saying here because of this specific person and the way he wrote this book. But you're a translator, uh, and I know you know a little bit about uh, Fernando Pessoa. Um, so what do you think from what I've said to you, especially about the translation part and also how you put it together after someone's dead um, and, and put it chronologically as well? Is this, this putting together a book, it's a, it's a fascinating process. So you can give me your thoughts about anything, really. <laughs> about anything. Yeah. Even if it's not related. Um, the whole part of the translation, I was laughing because it sounds like a bit of an excuse, you know, like a getaway clo- 
close as in, well, I don't really know what it means, so, but anything will do. Um, I don't know, it's an interesting take, I guess. Um, a lot of translators, I think, for this kind of author, um, they know them well. It's not something that anybody can just translate uh, just one, the other work. You know, most of these people, they have is the same as Joyce, that they have a whole universe, they have a whole language that is just uh, their own. So they need somebody, you know, who specializes in, like, basically getting to know that universe and, 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 and yeah, portraying that, you know. Um, so, I don't know, I find it, I mean, I suppose that's what they are getting at by, by saying that, that if you know uh, what you think he wants to convey, then even if you're not entirely sure, like, you can have a, a good guess that, uh, I suppose the same as with poetry, that sometimes, you know, you might uh, get it wrong, but if you know the author, you should be able to to have a good guess at what they are trying to say, even if it's an obscure metaphor or whatever, or how to, not so much what they're trying to say, but how to convey it in your own language and create the same effect, even if it's not exactly, you know, word for word translation. Okay. Okay. I was too far from the mic there. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, I understand. Um, she gives an example of, of he's describing um, these these rooftops and um, the words he uses sometimes just don't really make sense. Um, but that's obviously the writer's remit to do that. Um, so I just uh, some people are easier to translate than others, you know. Um, I think. I know. Um, but yeah, I, I just as I mentioned, it's a it's a romantic story in a sense. Um, this writer unanswered questions why somebody would feel the need to kind of write with these different personas because you can write different characters but but the fact that the book is written by somebody else is a whole other level to that that I, I i don't understand yet um and you know and also you know he there's a like there's the guy in the second part of the book he's not a big reader apparently like he has books on on, on his next to his bed that he flicks open but but this guy in real life read voraciously as well. So you can, you can see as well sometimes like that the biographical details don't exactly match with the author and the, and the persona that he's created to represent himself. Um, but also uh, on the front cover of the book, um, there's some quotes, of course, on the back cover as well. And, you know, it just people say the common thread seems to be that if you read it, you won't put it down because this is like reading something about people and the human condition and that's the pretentious alarm going off again but um the idea that there's this guy who uh is talking about being disaffected or cut off or somehow alienated uh by society which is a very timeless thing as well but um so i guess it's kind of fitting that he was so cut off, nobody knew about the book until after he's dead. And it was published like 40 years after that as well. So, um, so it just, it just, it just, um, it's, it's everything. It's, it's, it's this, um, diary that isn't a diary. And it's about emotions that we all feel, I guess. And, um, it's, it's, it's impenetrable to a sense as well. Um, especially the first part. It's it's everything and nothing. It's everything, and I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. But, <laughs> You're just repeating uh, everything and nothing. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's it's a surprising book. It's a different book. It's a book, and that's how I'll finish talking about this book. <laughs> well, I mean, you still have a lot to read. So, but a lot of the things that you said is sort of resonated, you know, with Joyce, like all this thing about. Uh, how it's about a human condition and some people find it very enlightening but others find it that they just don't understand what's going on at all. Yeah, well... well he made up some words as well. Yeah, well, the thing is, though... Similar period as well. Yeah, but, you know, for example, like, the first two books of Joyce aren't impenetrable. And I know this guy has written other books. I don't know if they are impenetrable or not. But James Joyce... Uh, impenetrable writers. Uh, but but, his, but James Joyce's first two books aren't. They're very easy to read. Mm. Ulysses at this goes from zero to 60... 
you know, out of nowhere almost. Um, and um, yeah, we said the human condition. I guess every writer talks about that, even Harry Potter. But this is more about the idea of like one man in a city and what is this physical landscape and what is his place in it, you know? That kind of human condition. And that's very... Yeah, so you must be like portrait of a young man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's choice. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, that's where they interconnect, I think. Yeah. Now, of course, um, Fernando was not a hit with the ladies, but James Joyce was. So <laughs> that would be a key difference there, I think. Fundamental. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that is interesting... In terms of, I mean, Ulysses is full of it, you know, um, of the, the naughty stuff. Um, and then, uh, I mean, this book is full of the absence of it. Um, and that kind of is a defining <laughs> characteristic as in, why am I alone kind of thing, you know. Um, I, he, he sounds like he's a whiner, but so far he's not. Um, so we'll see how it develops. So a surprising book. And uh, I guess we can kind of come back and revisit it when I've actually finished it as well, you know. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> I think we can get an update in saying that it's, uh, it's got two parts. Then after you read the second one, it might completely change well, your mind. I, well, I already know the second part's going to be much better. Um, but um, it's uh, so meta as well. Um, that, 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 uh, that the book, the first part of the book is like, the author Fernando reading the manuscript given to him as well so it's, just, it's like inception level of layers there um, so yeah so, of the yeah yeah um, so yeah there's that book uh, I guess we can touch briefly on on the other one before we we finish yeah um, so yeah so this is called uh, the the book is called Tell Me No Lies by John Pilger. And now John Pilger is an Australian uh, journalist who I've also grown up reading. So if I grew up watching or listening to Ernie Morricone, I grew up reading John Pilger. And he's written many books like Hidden Agenda talking about the role of the media, positive and negative, uh, in perpetuating human rights abuses around the world. And of course, you already know that we've written fake news uh, and we, it's also um, about journalism, and uh, we do pay credit to journal uh, to journalists at the end of the book who are trying to keep um, the integrity of, of real news and truth um, alive. You know, and and you know, I mean, this is this hacks back to people who were doing this since before fake news was even a concept, uh, and he's a guy who's who's done it himself as well and the first uh three chapters the first four chapters does just to give you an idea of how different they are the first chapters of a british um journalist this woman who goes to uh, a deck camp uh she goes to auschwitz and she reports on it and she was not supposed to be there uh she kind of hitched a ride uh on the way to d-day and uh she writes in a very eloquent way about people that used to be people you can just tell how shocked she is at the physical state of, of, of people there. And even the last place she goes to is like the... If you've ever seen a prison movie or prison documentary, there's always like an isolation cell, the cooler, you know? And there's one of those places in, in this dead camp. And she asked the question quite legitimately, why would you in a dead camp need any an extra layer of punishments, you know, like an isolation um, kind of cell? Um, and... There's a woman in there who who's mad. She she said like we came two days later or whatever. She was mad uh, in there. Um, and then the second uh, chapter is about a, a journalist who uh, goes to Hir uh, Hiroshima, and this is an amazing story as well because he wasn't supposed to go there, but he sneaks there. He goes on a train. Uh, he, all he has is his typewriter and a pistol and like a few days worth of food, and. His conversations with doctors in the hospitals is very moving because they're like, we've tried everything. We've tried curing this. We've tried curing that. We just don't know what this is. And, of course, it's radiation poisoning. And, of course, and, and the Americans at the time were saying there's no radiation poisoning from nuclear bombs. Uh, the bombs fell, and now there's nothing, there's nothing else, you know. Um, and also, uh, he, he has interactions with Japanese people. And he said, like, 
the Japanese people were so, you know, loyal to the emperor. When there's war, there is war. If the emperor says there's peace, then the Americans aren't their enemy anymore. But they were there uh, before any formal truce had been signed. Um, and uh, he's in a train station, and, and Japanese soldiers are like giving him the stink eye. He gives him some cigarettes, and they play cards, and they kind of warm up to him. Um, and then he is on a train, and a Catholic priest tells him, like, just be careful, because they're surrounded by other Japanese soldiers, and they, they could cut you in a second. And it turns out he goes to a police station at one point as well, and he's, like, looking to find other locations where there's damage and stuff like that. And he found out years later, after going back, that the police took a vote whether to kill him or not, because they're so angry to see him, because he was this physical representation of, of their enemy, you know? Um, and then the third chapter is about uh, McCarthyism, uh, Ed- Edward Murrow and his broadcast uh, for CBS about Joseph McCarthy, which is also the subject of a movie, uh, Good Night and Good Luck. And um, in the fourth chapter is so different as well because it's about this, this woman whose sister married, uh, what's his name again? I butchered it yesterday. Mostly. Mostly, yeah, the British Nazi. Her parents were diehard Nazis, but she was a liberal, and she wrote uh, this big ex- expose about the American funeral industry and how there's pressure selling and the techniques of Madison Avenue to kind of exploit people so they can go for the deluxe death, basically. I mean, if the American dream is about consumer products and everybody sh- having cars and microwaves and in death, you have it's like a status symbol as well. And also they're like kind of playing on the guilt, you know, like when someone dies, you might feel... Um, oh, I did something wrong to them and that could be real or imagined but they're kind of like saying oh if you pay for a funeral you can kind of assuage that you can pay that back you know and she kind of cites it's like a satirical piece as well um, and she talks about how um, you know in the trade articles for people in the industry they're kind of using these concepts as if they're trying to convince each other that this is legitimate so when they finally go to the consumer they're ready to bullshit them basically you know um, so yeah, so I mean, it's a very varied book. Uh, people putting themselves into physical danger in a lot of the cases to tell stories that um, need to be told, and and very often people are trying to suppress them. And in fact, if the story about Hiroshima being published is a miracle in itself, uh, because General MacArthur and the American military were actively trying to kill that story um, as well. So I mean, this is a story, or this is a book that is infinitely interesting. Uh, very important it's an old book it's like from uh, the early 2000s but timeless as well um, and I'll tell you what, how timeless it is this is the last thing I'll say before we go to part 3 uh, I've taken to watching Australian 60 minutes segments on YouTube I have a life but <laughs> uh, and they had a thing about the Australian uh, funeral industry and how they're using the same techniques they didn't connect the two stories but but we can um, so um, it just shows like it, a lot of elements of this carry across through the different years as well. So yeah, that's those are my thoughts on on this book, which is easier to define than the other book. <laughs> Clearly. Well, we look forward to hearing about the other chapters because there's quite a few left, I think. Uh, yeah, there is. Good. Thank, so. you. Thank you for telling everybody how how much I've read. Well, you don't. You spoke about four chapters. Just to give, I was trying to present it like I. Oh, I so you a, haven't read the rest. Well, now they now they all know. You know. You know I've read John Pillar's other books in their entirety. Yeah. Uh, this is work in progress. Yeah, because we're doing very important projects and we're launching a new tour in Madrid about Irish people and their legacy. So we've been busy people. That's why we haven't been able to make much progress or as much as we want in terms of our reading. But we're getting there. We're getting there. So, uh, well, thank you for staying with us so far. Just stay a little bit longer for part three. And here we are again, part three of the podcast. 
So uh, this is the part where Maria, Mary, uh, plugs everything. So take it away, my dear colleague. So you can find us at irislasomadrid.com, that's our blog, um, on Twitter at elarpa1, on Facebook at elarpa media. Um, yeah. I want harder selling techniques. I'm not going to say the podcast because you're already listening to the podcast, so you know where to find us. Uh, yeah, you can find us on Patreon as well, and also at our website, fakenewsbulos.es, which is in Spanish, but it's dedicated to our book, uh, so you can learn more about it, us, and where to buy it. So uh, tune in uh, next time for another exciting installment of the Elaborate Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us on this one, wherever you are. I hope uh, you're enjoying life, if you are coming out of the COVID quarantine And if you're not, hang tight. I'm sure it's just around the corner. So thank you so much. This is me saying bye-bye. <laughs> I'm me saying bye. Don't laugh at my sincerity. <laughs> the Alapa Podcast, the home for cultural chit-chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk. People will talk.